My name is Anthony Harrison. Um, I'm speaking to you from the UK. I'm sorry I can't be with you, um, but uh, logistics didn't quite work for me. Um, today I'm going to describe um, software bill of materials uh, and how a number of Python tools can be used to help. Don't worry if you don't understand what a software bill of material is. Um, I'm going to introduce the key concepts through this presentation. Okay, a bit about me. Um, I'm a solution architect uh, and a cybersecurity consultant with particular interest in, in software security. Um, my journey into Python was primarily through um, education outreach and teaching uh, students um, the joys of coding, um, often through the Coder Dojo Foundation. In the past few years, I've been supporting uh, the Google Summer of Code uh, initiative and particularly supporting one of the Python um, software foundation applications and um, you'll see that later in this talk. Okay, our agenda this afternoon will provide a brief introduction to what an SBOM is, Software Bill of Materials, um, before describing a number of tools which could form part of your development life cycle. Um, I will then conclude with a, a brief summary. So what is a Software Bill of Materials? Who's going to use it? And why should I be really interested? So briefly, a software bill of material is a formal set of machine-readable metadata that uniquely identifies your software package, typically including version and supplier information. It can, contents may also include other relevant information, typically including copyright and license data. A good analogy is to think of an SBOM as a list of ingredients in your product. SBOMs are typically designed to be shared across organizations, hence the importance of a formal definition, and are particularly helpful in providing transparency of the software supply chain. Increasingly, organizations are concerned with software security in the supply chain, so SBOMs are increasingly a cornerstone of a cybersecurity strategy. SBOMs aren't that relatively new. They've been around for more than a decade. I think it's in the more recent past, they've become more important. As demonstrated in the last 12 months, as I've noticed a significant upturn in interest in SBOMs across industry. If we look last year in May 2021, the US President's Executive Order on Improving Cybersecurity, SBOMs were identified as a key enabler to providing greater transparency to the construction of delivered software. Then in December, we had the famous Log4j um, vulnerability. I know that's a Java. Uh, incident, and you wonder why your Python program is interesting. But what it demonstrated to me was the need for SBOMs in an organization, because organizations really struggled to say whether they were impacted by the Log4j uh, vulnerability. Did they know they actually had Log4j in their software products? What it also identified was the importance of software dependencies and the different types of dependencies. More about that in a minute. In February, the Linux Foundation produced a research project looking at the awareness of SBOMs across industry and organizations. They supported, came up with two conclusions at satisfying that SBOMs were going to be enabling better transparency um, in the supply chain and also providing a better understanding of software dependencies. And finally, in May, uh, OpenSSF published a number of recommendations about improved cybersecurity practices, particularly in open source. And one of the recommendations was simply titled SBOMs Everywhere. That's a wonderful statement. Um, with the aim of improving SBOM tooling and training to drive greater adoption. And I'm expecting later this year to start seeing some industries to mandate SBOMs to be part of their product delivery, particularly expecting things like in the healthcare market. So you can see there's a lot happening. 
And if we also look at dependencies, a typical Python application is a bit like an iceberg. We write our code, maybe import a package, test it, and then release it. However, have we really thought what we've really done with a simple import of a package? In addition to the obvious of saving us writing code, it may have also brought additional baggage with us, often hidden. You can often see this when you do a pip install and you get more than one package being installed. However, these packages are often hidden, certainly from your code, because you don't have any import statements visible. So these hidden dependencies may be also hitting, hiding vulnerabilities, which might be of interest for security. You can see this on the right-hand side, where a red package is installed, the blue blobs are the uh, direct dependencies, and the green ones are the implicit or hidden dependencies, just like an iceberg. There are a minimum set of elements that you need in an SBOM, obviously the product name, its version, and the supply name, but also dependency relationships are very key, as is the timestamp of when the data was assembled, because obviously when we assemble the data, that could be quite an important part of a, a security audit, what, we're, what software releases we were running at a particular time. The author of the SBOM data as well, as well could be not doesn't necessarily need to be the creator. It could be a consumer who basically is producing that as maybe as part of their overall um, software audits or software asset management. I can't remember how many times when I've always I've come across multiple standards in this in a in a um, in a, in a when standards are there. So S bombs are no different. There are two standards: SPDX which is um, promoted by the Linux Foundation, and the Cyclone DX standard, which is originated from the OWASP organization. The SPDX format is the older of the two, and it's been around for more than a decade, and is now an ISO standard. It, it is under continuous organ um, revision, and there's expected to be a major upgrade later this year, which is going to have better support for security vulnerabilities. It supports the production of SBOMs in a number of different formats, including JSON, tag value, essentially text, uh, YAML, and XML. Cyclean DX is a, a, a community-driven uh, standard, so it's slightly more dynamic, um, and it provides SBOMs in both JSON and XML format. Although there are two formats, there is good interoperability between these two formats, so you can transform an SBOM in one format to the other format relatively straightforward. So now we, we hopefully understand what an SBOM is. Let's now look at some of the tools and how we can use them in a development lifecycle. So the first item I'm going to consider is the production or the generation of an SBOM for a Python module. So when I started developing a module, there were three issues I was particularly interested in. One was, what was the best way of cap capturing all the package dependencies? Secondly, how could the Python ecosystem support SBOM creation? And thirdly, how difficult is it to generate the necessary content in the correct format of an SBOM? So let's look at dependencies first. I think we need to distinguish between explicit dependencies and implicit dependencies. In Python, explicit dependencies are typically specified within a requirements.tx file or equivalent, and are therefore relatively easy to identify. However, what they doesn't do is explicitly say which version of a component is installed, there may be some version constraints, but it doesn't necessarily have the explicit version. And it doesn't identify the supplier of the module. Implicit dependencies are these hidden dependencies, dependencies on dependencies. So how can these be determined? Well, the Python inconsistent comes to the rescue, and if particularly PIP. 
We can see PIP shows a lot of the metadata that's associated with an installed module. And we can see that most of this data is useful in the SBOM. We can see the name of the module. We can see the version, the installed version, and the supplier or author. It also shows the license, all, the, all good stuff. But it's the requires uh, attribute that I found most interesting because that shows the list of the dependencies. And then these, the list of these can then be used to drive the implicit dependencies by finding, the, finding these dependencies as a list and examining that, the metadata for those packages. So in this example, we've got PyTest, and we can see Atras is a, a dependency. We can then go and find the dependencies of Atras by just doing the recursive process. So there's a module called SBOM for Python that we've created, which generates an SBOM file for the installed module. And it's compliant with the minimum content of an SBOM and produces machine readable format in one of the two standards. And is available now currently on PyPy for, for evaluation. But while I was generating it, I found that the consistency of the metadata was variable in particularly two attributes. If we look at the license metadata, in particular standard licenses like Apache or MIT, there was not a particular consistent way. If you look on the left-hand side, you can see these are all instances I found of the way that Apache 2 was specified. All probably quite readable, all quite understandable, but not consistent. Both SPDX and Cyclone DX use the SPDX license list and the formal definition of an Apache 2 is Apache License 2.0, or in short form in brackets, Apache 2.0. You can see on the right hand side, the MIT license, there's just a difference in case in one of them between a capital L and a little, uh, a small L. It would be really good if Python modules, when specifying the licenses, adopted a consistent approach, maybe the SPDX license list would be a good standard to follow. Similarly for supplier identification, the SBOM standard wants to identify, is it an organization or a individual or person who's created the module? So the metadata in an SBOM um, needs to do this, how can we determine whether it's an individual or organization from the metadata that's captured in the Python module? Can we just work on the number of words, for example? Is the name of the organization consistent? Probably not. Um, so maybe, again, we need to maybe think about some consistency. Is there a way that we should be adopting when we specify the metadata, whether the metadata refers to an organization or an individual or a set of individuals? So this is what an example of a SBOM looks like. Um, and this is the format, which is called tank value. And you can see this at the key attributes, things like the package supplier name, and I've identified this as an organization, um, the version and the license. Um, again, there's, there's, there's some various things like there's the date that the, the uh, file was created. So this is all quite, quite um, understandable and is ideal for being passed into other tools to process it. So let's look at now managing um, an SBOM um, because it can support a number of use cases. Remember I said earlier that SBOMs were typically increasingly being used in activities to support cybersecurity strategies. So these are the typical use cases that people are going to be asked about, am I using this product? Am I using this version? Um, and I wish this, I wish I had a tool like this when the Log4J was around, because this would have been a really a, a efficient way of identifying and triaging so many products. So a key one was the vulnerability analysis. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So the SBOM manager, manages a collection of SBOMs in, the, in the, either Cyclone DX or SPDX format, and it allows you to re re readily identify the components that have been included in the software build and supports these use cases. 
Again, this is available on PyPy for you to enjoy. And here's an example. Am I impacted by a vulnerability? If we look at this vulnerability with sudo, it's saying, do we have sudo installed before this version 1.9.5 patch 2? And by just interrogating the list of SBOMs that, were, that have been uh, included in the manager, then we can see that, yes, we have a version of sudo on one of our SBOMs, and it is at a version less than 1.9.5.2. So we can say we are possibly impacted. It obviously needs a little bit more analysis, but at least it's been an efficient triage to try and identify whether I'm impacted or not. And this is the one that I would love to have had in December. If I'd have had all my S-bombs and I would have got a set of Java applications, and that would have been a really happy day scenario. Finally, I want to look at how we could scan, use SBOMs and scan them for vulnerabilities. And um, let me introduce you to another tool called CV and BIN tool, which is initially a binary scanner to determine whether binary files have potentially vulnerable packages or libraries. But it also scans SBOMs for vulnerabilities in their components and produces a, a list of the components with reported CVEs and um, the associated severity. And this is the tool that uh, the Google Summer of Code is uh, enhancing. So there are a number of students that are currently actively working on this to, to add new facilities and capabilities. And this is the output that it will generate. As you can see, uh, it's a list of product versions and vendors or suppliers with their associated CVEs and severity. Um, a word of caution, as with any of these types of tools, is uh, security scanning is um, doesn't guarantee that it's found all the vulnerabilities, nor does it guarantee that you are affected by all the vulnerabilities. Um, but let's hope it's an aid to your process. So nearly finished now. So I think we've now got a suite of tools there that can support S bombs. Uh, particularly as a DevOps or DevSecOps pipeline, and particularly looking at maybe managing your security exposure and the security vulnerabilities of your installed products. So to summarize, um, I think hopefully now you know a little bit more about SBOMs um, and a little bit more about the importance of understanding your dependencies. Um, I think the Python community has a role to play in trying to ensure that we have consistency across our metadata to support SBOMs uh, being used in the wider software and systems ecosystem as a way of supporting better vulnerability management processes. And just a thought, is it now time that when we do a pip install, we actually create an SBOM and do some vulnerability scanning as part of the integral part of the installation. Um, there's a few references there to um, resources I've ref referenced in the uh, in this talk. Um, copies of the slides are available on my uh, repo on GitHub, um, and where there's also access to some of the tools as well. And there's access to the CVE bin tool on the Intel's tool as well. Thank you very much. Any questions? Hi, thanks a lot. Uh, you mentioned the presidential uh, notification about SBOMs. Are you aware of any UK or EU based moves to put them uh, in place as an aid to cybersecurity? Not currently. Um, I've asked about the UK. And they um, and they have said that they will just follow best practice initially. So this is like the National Cybersecurity Centre, um, and they they will hope that industry will probably dictate best practice. But there's no formal need at the moment, um, and I'm not aware of anything from the EU. Maybe in the UK, I'm less interested in the EU these days after Brexit. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for the talk. Um, the tools you uh, showed there, the uh, the creation tool, um, S1 for Python, is used for finding uh, 
information about Python dependencies. Do you know of any libraries that can help with uh, non-Python dependencies, such as operating system library or, and things like that? <laughs> A good question. Um, there, there, there appears to be no tools that is a one-size-fits-all tool. Um, the tools tend to be focused on the lang language ecosystem, so Python, like Go, like Rust. Um, to find operating system ones, I'm not aware of anything. Um, I suspect I've seen something from Google looking at things like Kubernetes infrastructures and containers, which are generating S bombs for a container image, but I haven't seen one for um, an operating system distro yet. Thank you very I'd much. Like to, I'd, li I'd like to create one because I think I can see there's a really important need for something like that um, to see what you've in what's installed and what's running in your operating system. Yeah, it seems like you have to use a patchwork of tools at the moment to get the, the a, a full list of materials. Um, yes. But thank you. Yeah, there, there, there's no tool, I'm not aware of any tools that cover all, all the bases. Um, I don't know whether that, whether that will change over time. But, um... So, uh... Thank you very much, Anthony, for your talk. It was very interesting. Okay, thank you very much. Bye.